everybody, Mr. Judson here. So we're still looking at um, functions and where they are increasing or, or decreasing. And today our, our, our goal is to kind of push that a step farther. You know, if we think about it, if a function is increasing and then decreasing, the point at which it changes from increasing to decreasing, there's a relative maximum there. And same thing if we're decreasing, then we change to increasing, we've got a relative minimum. So we can use this as a, a way to find relative maximums and minimums. All right, so I've got a, a question here. Um, I'll go ahead and read it and I'll zoom in on it so you guys can see a little bit better. But it says, um, the concentration C of a chemical in the bloodstream T hours after injection into the muscle tissue is, is given by this equation. C of T equals 3T over 27 plus T squared where t is greater than zero. Okay? Use calculus to determine analytically the time when the concentration is the greatest. So really what they're asking us to do is to find a relative maximum for this function. And we can do that through our first derivative test. Okay? Let, me, let me zoom in just so you guys can see this. Alright, so I want you guys to go ahead and use our first derivative test um, to try and answer this question. Alright, well if I'm going to use the first derivative test, um, the first thing I need to do is find my critical points, which means I need to take the derivative of this. So let me start my work over here. C prime of t is going to equal, so I have to use a quotient rule, so low d high, so 27 plus t cubed d high, which would be 3, less high d low, so that would be 3t times 3t squared. All over low squared will go. Alright, so I think the only thing I really have to do with this is just simplify the numerator. So I'm going to have 81 plus 3t cubed. Here I got a negative 3t times this, so that'll be a negative 9t cubed. All over 27 plus t cubed. You got to square that. And then if I add my like terms, I'm going to get a negative 6 t cubed plus 81 over this. 27 plus t cubed, and i got to square that. So now, now I need to find my critical numbers. And critical numbers happen um, where the numerator equals 0 or where it's undefined which would be if the denominator equals zero. So, let's see, I think I'm going to... Do I want to try and factor that? I'm just going to set this equal to zero and solve. Okay, so I'll, I'll come over to the side here and say negative 6t cubed plus 81 equals zero. I'll move that negative 6t cubed over here. So it becomes positive. I'll then go ahead and divide by 6. And then I'll take the cube root of that. So t is going to equal. All right, so I'm going to grab a calculator here. And we'll turn that on. I'll clear everything off. F18, clear, get rid of that. So I want the cube root of 81 over 6. So in parentheses, I'm going to go 81 divided by 6. And I'm just going to raise that to the 1 3rd power, 1 divided by 3. Make sure you put that one-third inside parentheses, okay? Exponent of one-third is the same as taking a cube root of something. And there's my exact answer, if I want that. Um, I'd rather have a decimal answer. So we put a decimal point in there. So about 2.381. And if I look at this, we are undefined 
at x equals negative 3. Right? Negative 3 cubed would be a negative 27. 27 minus 27, I get 0 in the denominator, and we can't have that. Um, negative 3 isn't even in the domain, so I don't have to worry about that. Our domain is that t has to be greater than 0. And that's because if, if someone's taken a, you know, some kind of medication and, and they take that, that's time equals 0. You can't talk about what happened before they took it. Right? All right, so um, I'm starting at 0 and working off to infinity, so my intervals now, remember we're doing the first derivative test. My interval would be from 0 to 2.381, and then from 2.381, I guess, off to infinity. So I only have two intervals that I have to check. All right, so I need a test number. I'm going to check the sign, and then we will draw a conclusion. So a good number here would be 1. A good number here would be 3. I need to plug that back into the derivative. So that means I need to be able to see this right here. I think that's my simplest form of a derivative. So no matter what number I plug in, as long as it's greater than 0, this is always going to produce something positive. Right? 27 plus a positive number cubed, that's got to be positive. Squared, it's still positive. And so really all I care about is, is the numerator. So if I plug a 1 into there, I'm going to get 1 cubed, that's 1, times negative 6. That's okay. Negative 6 plus 81, that's positive. And so a positive divided by a positive, we get a positive result right there. If I plug in a 3, so 3 cubed is... 27. 27 times 6, that would be more than 120 on the negative side. So a negative 100 and something plus 81, that's a negative number. Divided by a positive, that's negative here. And so we were increasing, and then we start to decrease. So if your function's going up, and then it begins to decrease and go down, what that means to us is we have a relative maximum at this value right here. At x equals 2.381. So whatever this medication is, once you take it, uh, if our time is in hours, you know, 2.381 hours later is when it's at its maximum strength. If that's a painkiller, that's a long time to wait for a little bit of relief, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean that you have to wait that long for relief, but that means that's when it's at its best. You know, you might start feeling some relief after maybe 45 minutes. Um, I think I asked the doctor this for my foot surgery. You know, if I take a painkiller, how long does it take it to kick in? Well, 30 to 45 minutes. So then you start to think, okay, after surgery, do I want to wait till it really hurts and then take pain, med pain medication? so that you don't feel any benefit from it until, you know, half an hour to 40 minutes, 45 minutes later, so you got to deal with that pain for a while. Um, you know, I think a lot of people would say right after surgery, just, you know, go ahead and give me that, that painkiller so I'm okay, you know, to begin with. And then maybe when I start to feel it come on just a little bit, you know, then I know I should take something to, you know, help for the next however long that stuff lasts. Okay. But this would be the point at which it's at the maximum strength uh, whatever this, they don't tell us what kind of medication this is. It's at its maximum strength and helping you the most. Okay. I've, I've heard this. Now, don't ever, this is not Dr. Judson giving medical advice. <laughs> but I've heard this before that um, when you take, uh, you know, some kind of medication, sometimes doctors will tell you to take a double dose in the beginning. Because, you know, maybe this is where the pain threshold is. And they have you take a double dose, so it goes up like this, and then as it starts to wear off, then you take another dose, and then another dose, you know, so that you stay above that, that point where things are, are hurting, okay? Where, you know, if I don't take a double dose, <clears throat> then my, 
pain medication might do this. It goes up and then starts to wear off, but I gotta wait for six hours and I take it, and then I gotta wait, and then so you only have a little bit of relief compared to you know really helping out with that that pain that you're feeling. I was happy when I had my previous surgery in October. I only had to take one pain pill and I was fine after that. So I, I guess that's a good thing. You don't want to take more of that stuff than you have to. So let's see, just to make sure I've answered this correctly, um, I want to make, see, time is in, oh, right there, T hours, yeah. So I'm just going to say that the medication reaches a maximum level at 2.381 hours. There's my clear answer at the end. All right, let's try another problem. All right, so this is kind of where we're going to go with this, you know, whole idea of checking intervals to see where it's increasing or decreasing, is we really want to analyze a function and, and sketch a picture of its graph. Now again, the word sketch doesn't mean we're perfect, but we're, we're doing a pretty good job, okay? We're getting things in, in the right spot. So in order to do this, I want to first of all think of, okay, where are the zeros? Where is it undefined? Are there any asymptotes? Um, and then I want to use my first derivative test as a way to decide where is that function increasing and where is it decreasing. And that's going to help me find the maximum and minimum values uh, for this graph. Okay? So when it says analyze, it means write down as much information as you can and then draw that picture. So let's look at this first one together, and then I'll let you guys try the next one, okay? So here's what I would do first. I would look at this and say, I think I can factor that. This is going to be x minus 4 times x plus 1 over x minus 2. Uh, so double check the middle term. I've got 1x minus 4x. That does give me a negative 3x. So what I know right now is I have zeros at x equals 4 and negative 1. I know there's a vertical asymptote. Uh, so vertical asymptote at x equals 2. And I also look at this and I see that the, um, the exponent in the numerator is 1 larger than the denominator. So if you remember from last year, that means we get a slant asymptote. All right, so we have to do uh, division to figure out where that's at, and I'll do that synthetically. So let's see, I'm going to go 1, negative 3, negative 4, do my synthetic division with 2. So I'll bring the first number down, uh, multiply and add to the next, so 2 minus 3 is a negative 1, and then negative 2 minus 4, that's a negative 6. And so this becomes x minus 1 minus 6 over x minus 2. And for a slant asymptote, we just look at this part right here. Okay? This fraction is going to be what draws the, the, the graph closer and closer to this asymptote without touching it. So I don't have to worry about that. Um, it just represents the distance between the two. Okay? All right, so I've got zeros, I've got vertical asymptotes, I've got um, a slant asymptote here. And so now I'm going to take the derivative and do my first derivative test. And, and this is something we're going to have to do on the Central Washington test. We're going to have to use our first derivative test as a way to justify where this function is increasing or decreasing. Okay? So let's see, let me take the derivative of that. So f prime of x is going to equal, I'm going to have to do a, a quotient rule, so I'll do low d high. Derivative of the high part is 2x minus 3 less high d low. d low is just going to be 1. All over low squared will go. I know people are looking at it. 
Everybody wants to do it. We all want to cancel that x minus 2 with this. But remember, we can't. This right here is part of something that's being added or subtracted with something else. I know we're multiplying right here, but it's part of something that's getting added or subtracted to something else. We can't cancel that. Okay? The only thing I could do is simplify it. So if I FOIL this, I'm going to get 2x squared minus 3x minus 4x and then plus 6. And over here I've got a negative x squared uh, plus 3x plus 4 all over x minus 2. And so then if I simplify that a little farther 2x squared minus x squared, that's x squared. Negative 7 plus 3, that's a negative 4 x, and then 6 plus 4, that's 10. And so now what I want to do is I want to, um, oh, whoops, over, this is supposed to be squared. All over low squared, right? So now I want to see where does this equal 0 or where is it undefined? I don't think that factors which means I have to use a quadratic formula. So this is one of those, you know, the, the rough problem gets rougher. Um, Got to do the quadratic formula. So for my uh, critical numbers, I, I know it's undefined at 2. So this is going to be at x equals 2. And then if I do the quadratic formula, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared. That's uh, 16 minus 4 times ac, which is 10. I can stop right there. 16 minus 40. I'm taking the square root of a negative number. So, so this function can't equal 0, so it's not producing any additional critical numbers. Our only critical number is at 2. But see, I, I don't really know this until I get this written down. Um, so, undefined. Can't take the square root of a negative number. So my only critical number was at 2. So now I'm going to make my first derivative test. I'm going to check intervals. from negative infinity to 2. There's our first interval. And then from 2 to positive infinity, there's our second interval. And so if I had to pick a number in this interval to test, I'm going to choose 0. If I had to pick a number here, I'll choose 3. And I need to plug those back into my original function. Uh, no, I'm sorry, into my derivative, which is right here. So no matter what, this is going to be positive right here. When I plug in a 0, I get 0, 0, and 10. So 10 divided by a positive number is positive. When I plug in a 3, I've got 3 squared, that's 9, minus 12. That's 9 minus 12, that's negative 3, plus 10, that's a positive number divided by a positive, so I got positive again, which means that we are increasing and increasing. So there is no maximum or minimum for this, for this function. So if I want to draw the graph now, um, let me get all my information onto this thing. All right, so something's happening at 2, and, and we had already said that there was a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. My zeros are at 4 and negative 1. 
So let me get that stuff in here. There's the vertical asymptote. I've got, oh, I have a slant asymptote at y equals x, x minus 1. So my, my y-intercept is negative 1. My slope is positive 1, so I'm going to go up 1 and over 1. Up 1, over 1. Just start right here, and I'll draw that diagonal just like that. Okay, going through the y-axis at negative 1. And so all I know is that we are increasing and increasing. And the only way that that can happen is if my graph does something like this. Let's see, I've got to make sure I hit my y-intercept, so let me just double-check that. If I, if I plug in zeros, I get negative 4 over negative 2, which is a positive 2. All right, so I missed that. Let me fix it. Got to hit this point right here. And then on this side of the asymptote, if I drew my graph like this, I'm decreasing then increasing. That's not happening. I've got to be increasing the whole time. Let's see. From this point right here, I went over 2 and up 1. So if I do the same thing, uh, this point right here. So I'm saying that's what this graph looks like. Oh, I forgot about my zeros. I think I got lucky. Should hit the x-axis at 4 and negative 1. That's this point and this point right here. Now, if you think about what we did last year, you know, once I know where the asymptotes are and I know where the zeros are and the y-intercept, do I really need to know that it's increasing and increasing? Not really, but that's part of the calculus. We want this to agree with what we're putting over here. And that's what we're doing. As you go left to right, we are increasing, and then here you've got to start low, and we're increasing there as well. Okay. On our Central Washington test, they're more concerned about this than they are anything else that I've written here. All right. All right, let's try another one. All right, so I want you guys to try this on your own. We want to, same thing, we want to analyze this function, find as much information as possible, and then sketch its graph. Okay, you guys go ahead and try it. All right, so let's see. I, I know right away there's a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. I know there's a 0 at x equals negative 3. You can also just write x-intercept at negative 3 comma 0. That'd be fine. This time our exponent is less than the denominator. And so anytime the exponent in the numerator is less than the denominator, it means there's a horizontal asymptote at uh, y equals 0. So if the exponents are the same, you just look at the leading coefficients. If this is larger by 1, that's a slant asymptote. And if this exponent is less than the denominator, then it's, at the, it's on the x-axis, Okay, the line y equals 0. Um, so that means there is no y-intercept. So now I need to run my first derivative test. So f prime of x is going to be low d high which is 1, less high d low, all over low squared will go. All right, so let's see. If I distribute that, I'm going to get x squared. I'll get a negative 2x times that. That's a negative 2x squared. Negative 2x times 3, that's a negative 6x, all over x to the fourth. Uh, if I add my like terms together, I get a negative x squared minus 6x over 4, or x to the 4th. All right, so now I need my critical numbers. You know, where does this equal 0, or where is it undefined? And so if I factor this, I'm going to factor a negative 
x out of both of these. So what I'm left with is x plus 6. Right? Just make sure if you multiply back, you get a negative x squared and a negative 6x. All over x to the fourth. So our, our critical numbers are going to be 0, negative 6, and 0. So we'll just say 0 and negative 6. So now I'm going to set up my intervals. So we're going to go from negative infinity to negative 6, then we'll go from negative 6 to 0, and then from 0 to positive infinity. I need a test number, I need a, a sign, I'm always looking for a sign, conclusion. Alright, so my test number, here I'll choose negative 7, here I'll choose negative 1, and here I'll choose positive 1. And, and we're plugging this back into our factored form of the derivative. Okay, so if I plug a negative 7 in here, I'm going to get a negative of a negative 7, so that's positive. Negative 7 plus 6, that's negative. No matter what, this is positive, so I got positive, negative, positive. That means this is negative, so we are decreasing right there. If I plug in a negative 1, the negative of a negative 1 is positive. Negative 1 plus 6, that's positive. This is always positive, so we are increasing. And then on the other side is 0. If I plug in a 1, I've got negative, positive, positive. That's negative. So we are decreasing. So I know there's a vertical asymptote here. So even though I change from increasing to decreasing, that doesn't mean there's a relative maximum. Right? Because we've got an asymptote there. That there won't be a point. But here I am decreasing and then increasing. So there will be a relative minimum at... Let's get this down a little farther. At negative 6 comma something. So to figure out the y value, this is really important. I've got to make sure I go back to the original function. Don't go plug it into the derivative because you're going to get 0, right? That's why it's a critical number. So if I go back to my original function right here, I'm just going to say f of negative 6 is a negative 3 over 6 squared, that'd be 36, and that would equal a negative 1 twelfth. So negative 6 comma negative 1 twelfth, that's a point on, on the graph, a, a relative minimum. All right, so now I'll pull a graph in here, and we'll sketch what we think this thing looks like. All right, so let me kind of go up here and take care of this stuff. So there was a 0 at negative 3 right here. Um, I've got a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. I've got a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So remember, it's okay to touch a horizontal asymptote. It's just as you go out to negative infinity or positive infinity, that's where you want to get close without touching. Okay? But anywhere in the middle here, it's okay to touch a horizontal asymptote. All right, so we know that we have a relative minimum at negative 6, comma, negative 1 twelfth. So that just means barely below the x-axis. That's our relative minimum. I wonder if this is one of those weird graphs that it comes down and, and gets down low and then goes back up and gets really close without touching. Um, I feel like I'm going to have to count by 
something else here to really make this work. I'm going to count by twelfths. Okay, so that means at negative six I come down to this point. Now I think my graph does this and then goes back and gets close without touching. On this side I have to decide if am I am I going to be up here or am I going to be down here? Well, if, if we look at our, our test, we said this function is decreasing from zero to infinity. So, could it go down here? No, if it goes down here, I'm increasing. Graph's got to go up here and do something like that. Wow, that's crazy. I got to know if we're right. So, to check this, we'll just go to our graphing calculator and we'll punch the original equation in. So, x plus 3 over x squared. So go to y equals, we clear all this stuff off. So in parentheses, I've got x plus 3 divided by x squared. And we'll just make sure it looks right. Yep, it does. And I'm going to go zoom option 4. Wow, looks like we did things right. <laughs> So, so, remember, I'm exaggerating this so I can see that relative minimum. You know, what if I want to see that right here? Well, we need to adjust our window. And let's just say for y values, I'm going to go from... All right, let's try one more. <laughs> oh, no. We got to do this with trig? <laughs> Come on, Judson. Yeah, we got to do it with trig, too. Hey, wait till we get to logs and natural logs and e to the x. <laughs> That's all coming. <coughs> all right, so um, yeah, let's see what we can do. We want to find zeros. We want to um, look for, uh, there's not many asymptotes here, but we want to run our first derivative test, see where it's increasing and decreasing. So you guys go ahead and give this a shot. All right, so I guess the first thing I'll do is I'll factor this. I can factor a cosine of x out of each of these. And if I'm looking for zeros, where does this equal zero? Well, where does the cosine of x equal zero? And where does the cosine of x equal one? Because one minus one would be zero. And so on the unit circle, Cosine equals 1 right here, and it equals 0 here and here, if I'm going from 0 to 2 pi. So this would be x equals pi over 2, or 3 pi over 2, and this would happen only at x equals 0. So I just got to remember when I graph this, I'm only graphing from 0 to 2 pi. All right, no asymptotes to worry about, so I just need to go straight to my first derivative test. <laughs> so the derivative of this. So I, I got to make sure I remember this, that f of x, when we have exponents with trig functions, we got to write it this way, and that's now a chain rule, uh, minus cosine of x. Okay, so f prime of x, Bring the 2 down in front, subtract 1 from the exponent, you've got cosine x to the 1 power, times the derivative of the inside, which will be a negative sine of x, times the derivative of the angle, which is 1. And now I'm going to take the derivative of this term, which would be a negative sine, so I'm going to subtract a negative, that means plus a sine of x. So I've got... 2, a negative 2, cosine x, sine of x, plus a sine of x. And so now I need to factor a sine out of each of those terms. So I get sine of x, and I'll write the 1 first because it's positive, minus 2 
cosine of x. And I want to know where does that equal zero. That's where my critical numbers are going to be. All right? So where does the sine of x equal zero? And if this whole thing was equal to zero, I would move this negative 2 cosine of x to the other side, and it would become positive, and then I'll divide by 2, so I really want to know where does the cosine of x equal 1 half. So we're back to our unit circle again. Cos or sine equals 0 here and here. So these are our critical numbers for our first derivative test. All right, so x equals 0 and pi. And where does the cosine equal 1 half? Uh, that would be at this angle and this angle, right? That's where I hit the halfway point. So pi over 3 and what's this one? Uh, 5 pi over 3? why that happens. All right, so there's my critical numbers. So now I need to set up my first derivative test from 0 to 2 pi. At least we're not going to infinity, right? All right, so let's see. Here's my intervals. So I'm going to start at 0, and the first angle I will hit is pi over 3. My next interval will be from pi over 3 to pi. And then I'm going to go from pi to 5 pi over 3. And then from 5 pi over 3 to 2 pi. So now we need some test numbers. Um, so, you know, if you look at the unit circle, that can kind of help a little bit. I'm going from 0 to pi over 3. Let's just take the tick mark right in the middle. Pi over 4. Um, and then from, from pi over 3 to pi, so let's take pi over 2. That sounds like the easiest one. And then from pi to 5 pi over 3, this sounds like the easiest one, 3 pi over 2. And then from 5 pi over 3 to 2 pi, I'll take the middle tick mark, that's going to be uh, 4, 5, 6, 7 pi over 4. You're getting some good trig review right now, huh? <laughs> Alright, so then I want to know what the sign is. When I plug these angles back into the first derivative, and then my conclusion. All right, so what was that first derivative? So I'm going to use this right here. Okay, that's what I want to plug into. So if I put pi over 4 in there, I get a positive number. Cosine of pi over 4, that's going to be root 2 over 2. So the 2's will cancel. So 1 minus the square root of 2. Well, the square root of 2 is more than 1, right? So I'm subtracting more than what I have here. So that should be a negative number. This should be a positive number. Positive times a negative is negative. So our function starts off decreasing. All right, let's put pi over 2 in. If I put that right here, sine is positive. If I put pi over 2 right here, I get 0. Negative 2 times 0, that's 0, so I get 1. So a positive times a positive, that's positive. We're increasing. Then let's put 3 pi over 2 in. So if I plug this angle back in here, my sine is going to be negative. It's a negative y value. If I put it right here, the cosine of 3 pi over 2, that's the x-coordinate, is 0. So I got 0 times negative 2 again. So that just leaves us with 1, so I've got a negative times a positive, that's negative. 
and then 7 pi over 4. So let's see, coordinate there would be root 2 over 2 comma negative root 2 over 2. So sine is negative. If I plug that in right here, I get cosine, which is root 2 over 2. Twos will cancel. I get 1 minus the square root of 2, which again is negative. The sine was negative, so negative times a negative is positive. Remember, once you get the first one, don't just assume that these alternate every time. It happens a lot, but we can't just depend on that because as soon as we depend on it, there will be an example, probably on a test, where that doesn't happen. Maybe you go negative, negative, positive, positive. I've seen it happen before. Okay. So, so make sure you test it out all the way. All right, so that means that this function is decreasing and then it's increasing, and then it's decreasing again, and then increasing. So if it's decreasing, then increasing, it's going down, then up, that means we have a relative minimum at pi over 3 comma something. And then we're going up, and then we start to decrease, we're going down, so we've got a maximum at pi comma something, and then we're decreasing, then we start to increase again, so we've got a, another minimum at uh, 5 pi over 3 comma something. <laughs> so now we've got to go back and plug these into our original function to see what their values are. It's the only way I can plot those points, right? All right, so let's see, what was that original function? Cosine squared minus a cosine. So let me just rewrite that. f of x equals a cosine squared of x minus a cosine of x. So let's see, cosine at pi over 3, that was 1 half. Right? So I'm going to put a one-half in here and square it, minus one-half. That would be one-fourth minus two-fourths. So I get a negative one-fourth. There's that y-coordinate. If I want to figure out what, the, what f of pi is, okay, f of... f of pi, I'm plugging that back into here. So the cosine of pi is a negative 1. Square that, you get a positive 1. Minus cosine of pi is a negative 1. And so that equals 2. So there's that one. These aren't as bad as I thought they'd be. And then my last point, I've got to figure out what f of 5 pi over 3 is. Since, since we're just doing cosines, the value of the cosine at 5 pi over 3 is the same as it was here, so it just equals the same thing. Right? If I go look at the unit circle, the value of the cosine here is 1 half, it's also 1 half down here, and so it's just the same thing. So this is going to be a negative one-fourth, and there's that point. So at least my relative maximum is a higher value than my two uh, relative minimums. All right, so I think I'm ready to graph this. So let's see, I need uh, some graph paper. I'll grab this trig one that I used last year. Um, I don't know if I used this with you guys last year. I think by the time COVID hit, I, you know, I don't know if we'd started graphing trig functions or not. Um, this graph paper is on my Sway page, so if you wanted to use it, you can print it out and use it whenever you want. All right, so, so to graph these, um, here's, here's my y-axis. This is zero. 
and I got to go out to 2 pi. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to treat this kind of like we did around the unit circle. I'm going to say that there's always five tick marks, and on the sixth one, that's where you hit pi over 2. Because that way it's going to make it easier to hit, hit these angles in the right spot. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, there's pi over 2. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, there's pi. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, there's 3 pi over 2. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right there is 2 pi. Okay. So now the three middle tick marks are the ones that we always focus on in the unit circle. Right? This is the one that we don't know anything about, and then this would be pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3. And I don't know anything about this one. Okay. You guys remember what you know what I'm talking about? If I, if I go back to my unit circle here, I put a tick mark in the middle and I put two on each side. So there's my 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 right there. That's how I'm labeling my, my graph. So we know at pi over 3, I should be at negative 1 fourth. I do get as high as 2. Uh, so I'm going to count this way. I'm going to say this is 1, this is 2. Negative 1, negative 2. So pi over 3 is right here. So I'm now plotting points. I've got a minimum at pi over 3 comma negative 1 fourth, which would be right about there. I've got a maximum at pi comma 2, which would be right here. And I've got another relative minimum at 5 pi over 3. So let's see, that means if I multiply by 4 to get twelfths, that'd be my 20th tick mark. So I'd go 6, 12, 18, 19, 20, and I want to be at negative 1 fourth. I suppose we've got to know where we're starting to, right? What do I get if I plug a 0 into this original function? Well, cosine of 0 is 1. Square that, you get 1. Cosine here of 0 is 1. So 1 minus 1 is 0. So I'm starting right here. And if I go all the way around to pi over 2, cosine is 0 again. So I'm at the same spot, right there. And let's see, where were my zeros? Oh my gosh. Um, my zeros were at 0 pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So I guess that's why we're also hitting 2 pi, because 0 and 2 pi are the same thing. So I had a 0 right here pi over 2, and right here at 3 pi over 2. Look at that. I've got, I've got my graph now. Relative minimum. Go up, have a relative maximum. Relative minimum there, and stop. There it is. Now we can check it on the graphing calculator. I'll let you guys do that. <laughs> hey, these problems are not fast. Right? There's a lot of stuff involved here. Um, I can tell you I have never seen a Central Washington test that does not have a question like this on it somewhere. I'm not saying trig, but something where we have to figure out where is it increasing, decreasing. You know, we've got to go through and do this first derivative test. And it doesn't stop there. There's also a second derivative test. Yep. All right, but we're going to stop here for today. Uh, so let me get you guys a homework assignment. All right, there you go. Um, four, four problems. I hope it doesn't take too long. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. This isn't funny. <laughs> um, so we're still on week 14. This is Wednesday's piece, page 187. We're going to do 37, 38, 43, and 53. All right, you guys, that's all we got for today. Um, and all isn't, doesn't mean not much, right? There, there was a lot there. Uh, so there we go. You guys take care. Stay safe. We'll see you later.